Welcome everyone to today's Schiller Institute event. My name is Megan DeBroat and I am the president of the Schiller Institute in the United States. The event today is entitled, The World Needs More People. Why True Economic Progress Depends Upon Population Growth. Now I hope many of you watching this are struck by that. Perhaps it's paradoxical. And maybe you say to yourself, well, I don't necessarily think we need fewer people, but more. Do we really need it? And hopefully by the conclusion of our discussion today, you will have been provoked at least to understand why expanding human population on Earth and off of Earth to billions and billions and billions of souls is absolutely essential for your and your grandchildren's survival. Now, before I introduce our speakers for today's event, let me say something about the context in which we're meeting today. Now, many of you may, and maybe some of you not, um, have been paying close attention to some of the recent escalations of the various and each very dangerous crises which are now underway across the globe. For example, over the recent week to 10 days, an extremely precarious and potentially explosive situation has been stirred up in Ukraine, in the Donbass region in the east, with military actors on the ground from Kiev and the Donbass, with heavy equipment being moved into the area, troops being moved, shells fired, accusations made, and so forth. And Zelensky and the Ukrainian government is now demanding or perhaps actually being told to demand a process for membership in NATO, which is a known red line for Russia. Um, Ukraine is saying, or there are rumors that Ukraine is saying it wants to take back Crimea. There are accusations against Russia of aggressively amassing troops on Ukraine's border for an invasion. Now, Russia has given very stark warnings that they are absolutely aware that this is being stirred up by the West in order to target Russia, and that in no uncertain terms will Russia be bullied. They've warned Ukraine that they are playing with fire and may not make it to the other side of such a foolish game. And a game it absolutely is. Russia is right in its accusations. Many of the members in and around the new Biden administration, like Victoria Newland, Michael Carpenter, and others, are the exact same people who in 2014 overthrew the legitimate government of Ukraine and installed neo-Nazis into power in that country. Now, yesterday, Secretary of State Blinken spoke with his counterparts in Germany and France and reaffirmed, quote, this is from the State Department release, their mutually unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, the need for Russia to end its dangerous and irresponsible rhetoric, its military buildup in occupied U uh, Crimea and along Ukraine's borders, and unilateral Russian provocations along the line of contact in eastern Ukraine. Now, this game doesn't stop there. The provocations against China also continue with, for example, the so-called freedom of navigation naval maneuvers in the South China Sea. There are also completely outrageous and provably false claims being thrown at China that China is committing genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. And just a quick note on the hypocrisy of all of this, those, there's much to point out, this weekend is the two-year anniversary of the journalist Julian Assange being thrown out of the Ecuadorian embassy to the wolves to um, be taken to rot away and be slowly killed in prison. So I know there are going to be activities around the globe um, supporting Julian Assange's release. Um, but on top of this, just yesterday, the, the State Department announced that it was issuing new guidelines on U.S. government engagement with Taiwan that, quote, reflect our deepening unofficial relationship, which is absolutely a well-known red line for China. Now, 
You add to this the absolutely astounding world hunger crisis, which has grown both in scope and in completely heart-wrenching severity over the past year to really unbelievable levels. The head of the World Food Program, David Beasley, who, who has been extremely sharp and outspoken on this, and he continues to stress that famine is man-made and that we have developed a vaccine against hunger called food. Um, David Beasley did an event on Wednesday to promote a new documentary which has been released on the crisis of malnutrition among the children of Yemen, which is called Hunger Ward. And at the event, Beasley reviewed the crisis. He said, he was speaking to a group of students. He said, when he came into office in 2017, there were 700 million people globally who were hungry, and 80 million of those were on the brink of starvation. Now, he said that that number of people on the brink of starvation has increased to 135 million just before COVID-19 began. And today, that number is 270 million people, with 34 million of those at the point of starvation. Um, he gave details of that, 19 to 20 million in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 19 million in Afghanistan, and so on. And he said pointedly, he said, I get upset. In 2020, a new billionaire was created every 17 hours. Now, just a note, that means almost 500 new billionaires that year. And Beasley said, all I need is $5 billion. Now, we also have a looming breakdown of the global financial system, which is right in the midst of all of this, and in fact, driving all of this. And I think you might hear more about that later in our event. Now, all of these are not separate crises. What we're looking at is a single breakdown event of the dominant global system. This is the system of geopolitics, of empire, which has become hegemonic since the end of World War II and increasingly since the fall of the wall in 1989. And that hegemonic system has collapsed. And the problem is the problem that we have today is not that we don't know how to fix it. It's not that we don't know what the solutions are to end poverty, to address world famine, to stop the wars. The problem is that the gut reaction of the elites, those in charge and running policy, the reaction of those people to the collapse of their system as consistent with their axioms and their view of man is to reduce the population. And that's coming through war, through famine, and through disease. Now, Schiller Institute founder and president Helga Zeppelarouche gave a webcast earlier this week. And in that she said, neither in the United States nor in Europe is the political establishment willing to reflect on why their policies are failing. Rather than change the policy, they say, okay, let's go for an escalation of the confrontation against Russia and China. And that will lead, Helga says, to potential disaster. And what she said is, what it comes back to is the question that we need a paradigm shift where we correct those neoliberal policies which have created the condition for the pandemic to arise in the first place. And it would require that governments change their policies to say, we are going for industrialization of the global South because that's the only way we can eliminate the conditions which make pandemics possible. It's a moral question. It would be so easy to change this. We could build ports, we could build railways, cities, it could be done. And it would be the motor for Europe and the United States to pull ourselves out of the present crisis on top of it. Now, our job here today, our goal, if you will, um, is that you, me, our speakers here today, and hopefully the other 8 billion or so souls on the planet today, come together to build a new anti-Malthusian alliance. Um, so I think I'll leave it there by way of introduction. Let me just very quickly introduce our panel for today. 
Um, so joining us, we have Diane Sayre, who is an independent candidate for U.S. Senate in New York in 2022, running against um, for the seat, which is currently occupied by Chuck Sch Schumer. Excuse me. Um, we also have, I don't see him, but hopefully he'll be joining us shortly, Dr. Kelvin Kem, who's a South African nuclear physicist and the former chairman of the Nuclear Energy Company of South Africa. We also have Jason Ross, who is on the board of directors of the LaRouche Organization and is a science advisor to the Schiller Institute. So before I turn it over to Diane, uh, we're going to play a statement that was sent to us by Philip Sokolibane. Philip is the leader of LaRouche South Africa, and he has a statement or a contribution rather to our discussion today. I'm Ramasimun Philip Sokolibane, leader of the LaRouche movement in South Africa and a member of Helga Zep LaRouche's Committee for the Coincidence of Opposites. Last October I issued an urgent warning that my country and the entire continent of Africa faced a threat of mass genocide from the twin killers of the COVID pandemic and starvation conditions, whose threat was also strongly voiced by David Beasley, head of the World Food Program. I demanded urgent action from all nations and the U.S. under President Donald Trump to make dealing with this crisis a priority. No action was taken by Mr. Trump, nor was any coordinated effective action taken by the rest of the world in coordination with the United States. I said people will die and they are dying in appalling numbers, well above so-called official death counts. There are urgent appeals for vaccines now available in the U.S. and stockpiled there, appeals that were also made by my president, Cyril Ramaphosa, speaking on behalf of the African Union, while China and Russia have responded, the appeals have been refused by the United States. I've repeated my urgent call for immediate aid to the new U.S. President Joe Biden. So far, there has been no response, only a continued refusal to send either food or vaccines. Africans don't need charity or pity from the West or from anyone. We need help now without murderous contingencies and strings that try to bind us to geopolitical schemes and sacrifice our sovereignty and dignity. We will not submit to the dictates of a global green order that says we cannot develop because we threaten the climate. I help lead demonstrations against the anti-African tool of British imperialism, Barack Obama, who came to my country to tell us that we should not want air conditioning or automobiles or technologies to raise our own food. We refuse such arrogant orders and reject policies of continued and forced under development justified now by the fake signs of the green world order. We have had great leaders with visions of African development against imperialist looting and underdevelopment. Nasa in Egypt, Nkuma in Ghana, Diop in Senegal, Mutala Mohammed in Nigeria, Garang in South Sudan, Lumumba in Congo, and of course Mandela in my country. They are for the most part isolated and ignored or assassinated by the imperialists. The great statesman and economist, the late Lyndon LaRouche and his wife Helga 
have sought to work with a new group of African leaders who will not bow and scrape to the imperial masters of the Malthusian Green Genocide Plan, but who will build a new just world economic order based on peace, cooperation and development. We have no choice but to fight for this new world order of development and peace now with all our strength and determination. The alternative is literally death, unnecessary but certain death, as the crisis facing Africa proves. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Diane Sayre. And I had the title of her presentation, but I've lost, oh, I found it. Um, so the title of her presentation is The Anti-Imperialist Mission of the United States. Diane? Great, thanks, Megan. And thanks a lot, Philip Sokolibane. I wish South Africa had the electricity and internet capability that Philip could be with us live more easily. Um, I'm on another journey of discovery, I'll put it that way, about some aspects of our nation um, and a certain role that we are to play in the world, which was really known by all of our greatest leaders, but has been not merely forgotten, but crushed very deliberately uh, since, well, we could say since Earth Day, but a little bit prior to that in the 60s. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I was very disturbed by seeing the photographs coming in from our southern border of what seems to be thousands of unaccompanied children um, who are being kept in crowded, terrible conditions. We don't have the facilities to hold them with a decent dignity that human beings deserve and the efforts to also pit the American people against these immigrants. There's an intense effort to cause people to identify other human beings as the enemy by moving them into centers like the Convention Center in San Diego, which was housing homeless Americans, and to create a dichotomy or have people say, well, why are we taking care of these people when we should be taking care of these people. And that's really not human and that is not acceptable. And that's not the way our founding fathers would have looked at this crisis. Uh, and I think, so I began thinking about this and thinking about what to do about it. Uh, and the first thought, of course, is, well, if we had a really productive economy in the United States, if we actually were going to build the 43,000 new miles of high-speed railroad that we need, the new nuclear power plants that we need, we would have more than enough work. We wouldn't have to worry about having a lot of immigrants. We could have millions more people in this country. But of course, you don't just want to say that and then have everyone empty out from other countries to come here when other countries should be developed as well. So that what became apparent is you have to have a program that addresses, in the case of our situation, uh, the Americas as a whole. And um, I began thinking about this some more and realized how much has gone into stopping exactly that, because it is the obvious thing for the United States to do. Now, I wanted to actually share with you a couple of quotes. You'll forgive me, there's a few things in here, but I just find them so exciting. So even though I'm reading, I hope you will as well. Uh, the first is a quote from DeWitt Clinton, which our friend Anton Shaitkin has discovered. Uh, he was uh, governor of New York. He was one of the instigators of the Erie Canal. And he gave a speech in 1794 where he said, Great improvements must take place which far surpass the momentum of power that a single nation can produce. 
but will with facility proceed from their united strength. The hand of art will change the face of the universe. Mountains, deserts, and oceans will feel its mighty force. It will not be debated whether hills should be prostrated, but whether the Alps and the Andes shall be leveled, nor whether sterile fields shall be fertilized, but whether the deserts of Africa shall feel the power of civilization nor whether rivers shall be joined, but whether the Caspian shall see the Mediterranean and the waves of the Pacific lave the Atlantic shores. Now, that's a very beautiful idea. I don't know how people would feel about the Alps and Andes being leveled, but um, I think you get the point. And that really called to mind something I'd read more recently, which is from David Lilienthal, the uh, director the chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority under Franklin Roosevelt, and he wrote this book uh, called Democracy on the March. But again, these images, he says, and this is after saying he's not very poetic, but he's incredibly poetic. I write of the Tennessee Valley, but all of this could have happened in almost any of a thousand other valleys where rivers run from the hills to the sea. For the valleys of the earth have these tilings in common, the waters, the air, the land, the minerals, the forests. In Missouri and in Arkansas, in Brazil and in the Argentine, in China and in India, there are just such rivers, rivers flowing through mountains, canyons, through canebrake and palmetto, through barren wastes, rivers that in the violence of flood menace the land and the people, then sulk in idleness and drought, rivers all over the world waiting to be controlled by men, the Yangtze, the Ganges, the Ob, the Parana, the Amazon, the Nile. In a thousand valleys in America and the world over, there are fields that need to be made strong and productive, land steep and rugged, land as flat as a man's hand on the slopes, forests, and in the hills, minerals that can be made to yield a better living from people. And in foreign but no longer distant lands, in the cities and uh, the villages in those thousand valleys live men of a hundred different tongues and many racial strains. As you move across the boundaries men have drawn upon their maps, you find that their laws are different, their courts and passport regulations, what they use for money. Different too are the words you hear, the customs in the home and in the market. But the things the people live by are the same, the soil and the water, the rivers and their valleys, the minerals within the earth. It is upon these everywhere that men must build, in California or Morocco, the Ukraine or Tennessee. These are the tilings they dig for and hew and process and contrive. These are the foundations of all their hopes for relief from hunger, from cold, from drudgery, for an end to want and constant insecurity. A thousand valleys over the globe and our valley here are in this way the same. Everywhere what happens to the land, the forest and the water determines what happens to the people. So uh, a couple centuries apart, or at least, yeah, 150 years. And the view is the same. The relationship between man, the creative power of the human mind, and the society, and the betterment of man's living conditions. Now, I tried to find a map of the British Empire in 1776. I think this is a little beyond what they had then, but if you could show that first map, Dave. Um, so this is after that, but gives you a sense. So you see there in the middle, that little island, the British Isles, and look at this huge area. Now they did get um, India fairly early on, late 1600s. They decided to create a colony in North America, uh, the Jamestown colony, 1607. Um, so that little place is running 
uh, or attempting to run and colonize vast parts of the planet, really the whole planet, frankly, if they could do so. And with horrible results, you can go to the next slide, um, which I will just show you a picture from India, the British East India Company. This was taken during the famine in the late 1800s, but this is what they were doing throughout. And what they were doing in India is no small part of the reason why people in the Americas knew that they were going to have to get their independence from them. So uh, now think about the location of the United States and our revolution. And you can go to the next map. I found this very striking. So if you look at the globe, the obvious thing is that we take this entire stretch of land from the northernmost reaches of Canada, the Arctic Circle, all the way down to Antarctica, right? The tip of Argentina, Chile, that this is a huge region and it could become a major bulwark against the policies of empire, against the British imperial looting system against their degradation of man. And in fact, this idea was not unknown to people. Um, it actually goes back as far as um, Henry Clay and earlier. You had people in Iberoamerica like Simone Bolivar in the early 1800s who were talking about this kind of development. And I would urge everyone to imagine in your mind's eye what the world would be like had we actually done this. Um, we probably would be on Mars by now. Uh, and it was very, very explicit, actually, the people promoting it, because they were aware of the British Empire, they were aware of some of the hostilities in Europe, the lack of trade, and they said, we have to have a market for American goods. That means that it's in our interest to raise the standard of living of all of our Southern neighbors so that we can trade with them. We don't wanna be dependent on the British or necessarily Europe for trade. We wanna develop markets and friendships in, in this part of the world. And it became very explicit in the mind of uh, James G. Blaine, who was the Secretary of State of President Garfield, and then who was the mentor of President McKinley, both of whom really tried to bring this kind of approach into reality, both of whom were assassinated. So think about that. Um, now, in 1901, do we have the picture of the Pan American um, Exposition? Yeah, this is the Manufacturing Hall at the Exposition. And what I'm gonna do is just read you, and uh, we have that text there, from the speech of President McKinley, which comes from the September 5th, the day before he was assassinated. Uh, these are just excerpts. To the commissioners of the Dominion of Canada and the British colonies, the French colonies, the republics of Mexico and Central and South America, and the commissioners of Cuba and Puerto Rico, who share with us in this undertaking, we give the hand of fellowship and felic felicitate with them upon the triumphs of art, science, education, and manufacture, which the old has bequeathed to the new century. Expositions are the timekeepers of progress. They record the world's advancement. They stimulate the energy, enterprise, and intellect of the people and quicken human genius. They go into the home. They broaden and brighten the daily life of the people. They open mighty storehouses of information to the student. Every great exposition, great or small, has helped to some onward step. Comparison of ideas is always educational and as such instruct the brain and hand of man. Friendly rivalry follows, which is the spur to industrial improvement the inspiration to useful invention and to high endeavor in all departments of human activity.
Who can tell the new thoughts that have been awakened, the ambitions fired and the high achievements that will be wrought through this exposition? Gentlemen, let us ever remember that our interest is in concord, not conflict, and that our real eminence rests in the victories of peace, not those of war. We hope that all who are represented here may be moved to higher and nobler effort for their own and the world's good, and that out of this city may come not only greater commerce and trade, but more essential than these, relations of mutual respect, confidence, and friendship, which will deepen and endure. Our earnest prayer is that God will graciously vouchsafe prosperity, happiness, and peace to all our neighbors, and like blessings to all the peoples and powers of earth. So this is the United States. In other words, our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, were never intended. In fact, you can't really have you can't say that all human beings are created equal unless you mean it for every human being on the planet. Doesn't mean you're going to run around invading countries and imposing policies on them, but it means you're going to do everything in your power to create the conditions economically and politically for every person to liberate themselves from the shackles of the oligarchical system. And this has been very much loss, but I don't think um, is really foreign to Americans. I think that people actually want to do the good. After all, that's what the Mathers said on essays to do good. Human beings want to do good. We don't want to be a country that's a, um, a blot on the progress of mankind. Um, and I think, you know, Megan just mentioned this question of the Assange case. I mean, here's a person, he's not American, he's from Australia, but who was pointing out crimes committed by the United States, by the UK and others. And instead of being open to say, hey, uh, in the name of forming a more perfect union, in the name of furthering this experiment of the United States, we're going to have to put a stop to these atrocities. This isn't what the United States is supposed to be. Thank you very much for pointing these things out to us. Uh, no, he's being left to languish and die in prison. I think it's really important to reflect on what's happened to the identity of the United States. Now, my presentation today, there's so much more that could be gone through. There's so many more details, uh, but I'm just trying to kind of give you an arc and a sense of also the very willful destruction of our identity and uh, and a way of thinking about what we what we should be doing and how this, I think, ties together some of the thoughts of the speakers that will also be with us. So we had Franklin Roosevelt, who I read you from David Lilienthal, he was very, very clearly of the same mind, very clearly anti-imperialist. We had president, but he was the British prolonged World War II willfully, uh, most likely, that's what Lyndon LaRouche said, to be sure that Franklin Roosevelt would be dead when the war ended, so that his vision of the post-war world where the British and the French and the Dutch would give up all their colonies and nations would have their independence and you would level the playing field. That was never brought into being, but instead you had Truman uh, trying to create this one world order, dropping nuclear bombs on Japan when it was in the process of surrender already. And you had a terrible shift. Then we had Kennedy, um, again, a certain kind of commitment, the civil rights movement, and we had in the United States four assassinations, uh, Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and the Vietnam War, and a real assault on the culture of the United States. And by 1970, we had the creation of, if you have that slide, Earth Day, which is going to be coming up here. And our President Joe Biden, um, there it is 
the first Earth Day, uh, April 21st, 1970. Um, terrible thing. Uh, at any rate, uh, that's coming up and Biden is going to be hosting a conference uh, where we will be try. he is trying to get everyone to agree to abandon progress for the foreseeable future. Now, part of this also related to this worship of the earth, mother earth, was to try and begin to inculcate a, a hatred of humanity and a denial that there's anything that distinguishes human beings from the animals. If you can go to the next slide, we had a book that came out, Paul Ehrlich, The Population Bomb, Population Control or Race to Oblivion. And you see this earth with a little fuse on it. And frankly, I think it's done as sort of ambiguously, right? The population bomb is everyone's baby. Uh, with Is it a fuse or is it an umbilical cord? And you hear the same thing coming from people in the environmentalist movement where they want to tell you what a tax on the planet every baby is. So instead of seeing a baby as a potential Einstein or a Beethoven or the potential scientist who's going to be curing cancer or uh, the person who's going to be designing the uh, manned colony on Mars, what you see is this baby actually is so many tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, it's really evil. It's really destructive. And what did we have also in the Vietnam War, if people remember body count Bob, Robert Strange McNamara, the way that the um, they wanted to tell you how we were winning the war or not was by how many people we killed. So suddenly, a war is determined not by whether you're taking terrain, not by whether you're uh, achieving a political objective or something like that, but merely in the number of people that you are killing. Um, now, I, it's in this time, in the late 60s, that Lyndon LaRouche began this organization. And he... His wife, Helga, often makes reference that, that he was really the only one in the late 60s who saw this question of culture as being a critical, critical question. And before we go to LaRouche, I'm just going to show you the last, the last slide here, which is um, from Theodore Adorno, uh, his insistence that we had to stop authoritarianism, that the only way to do that was to destroy one's identity and to destroy the human identity and order. And you literally wanted to induce insanity. And so he says, this is the perfect, this is the purpose of modern music. One, depersonalization, the loss of connection to one's own body. Two, Hebephrenia, and you can think at number one about all of these sex changes and so on it's, at, at any rate. Two, hebephrenia, uh, which he defined as the indifference of the sick individual towards the external. So what's happening in the world, what's happening around you is not of concern, of no interest to you. Three, catatonia, similar behaviors familiar in patients who have been overwhelmed by shock. You can think of these techno dances where you take drugs and and jump up and down and so on. And then four, necrophilia. Universal necrophilia is the last perversity of style. So love of death, death as an erotic pleasure. And this was a deliberate, um, this was deliberately induced, funded. These people were all based in Hollywood. You think about what Hollywood is to destroy the optimism, to destroy the culture of the United States. Think about what I read from DeWitt Clinton and David Lilienthal at the beginning, the idea of, you know, every valley shall be uh, um, exalted, uh, the crooked mates, all of these things, really, what human beings were going to do to transform the environment. In the case of Lilienthal, every valley is a place for human habitation to be developed and transformed. 
the incredibly optimistic view of that and the relationship between human beings and nature, which was not seen as unnatural, but natural. It is man's natural domain to develop the universe. And you had a total frontal assault on that. And today I'm afraid that Americans have very much lost, we've lost our way. We can find it back again, but I was reflecting on this idea, make America great again. Well, what really made us great? What made us great was our gift to mankind. What made our nation great was what we gave human civilization, what we gave to the planet, uh, a, a beacon on a hill, a light upon a hill. And that's our identity. And I think that we can get it back. Happily, China is doing what it's doing, and it should remind us what the actual mission of the United States is. So I'm going to stop there, but we will listen to the short clip of Lyndon LaRouche from a conference that was held in 1994. Uh, around this time, you had a horrible genocide in Rwanda and Burundi. Some people may remember that. And he addresses the British role, and I think it's appropriate in memory of Prince Philip. Uh, that you see this. Uh, you should know Helga said we should be on a virus alert since Prince Philip did say that he wanted to be reincarnated as a deadly virus. And the COVID first broke out. Some of us thought he might have, that might have been Philip then, but he was still alive. So we should watch out for a new one. But uh, go ahead, Dave. These institutions, that's the good. We have obviously benefited mankind. All mankind has benefited from European civilization, especially the European, modern European civilization, which dates from the Council of Florence. But mankind has suffered because modern European civilization is in terms of power per capita, per square kilometer, is the most powerful force on this planet. But this force has been taken over politically, financially, culturally, by evil, Venetian evil. So as what happens then, we have the host. The host is European civilization, the heritage of the Christian Renaissance of the middle of the 15th century. We have a parasite who is evil. The parasite has taken over the host, sucked its juices, shrunken it, looted it, depleted it, reduced people to conditions like slavery, destroyed virtually whole regions of the world. Is Africa has been destroyed. Sub-Saharan Africa is being destroyed by the British, not by racial conflict or national conflict, but by the British who create these conflicts. Rwanda was done by the British Thatcher government to the Queen's royal household, private household, to David Ogilvy, Lord Carrington, to Prince Philip, to Prince Bernard of the, of the Netherlands, who established the World Wildlife Fund, which is a branch of the International Eugenics Association, which brought you Adolf Hitler and brought you the racists in the United States. They went in there in order to turn black Africa, East Africa, South Africa, West Africa into a human game preserve in which the population is managed by park rangers in the same way they cull the herds of wild animal in game preserves. The organization which the royal family runs is run through the London Zoological Society a game preserve to protect the gorillas was the device by which Uganda, whose dictator is a personal agent of Linda Chaka, the overseas development minister, formerly under Mrs. Thatcher, now under Mr. Major, used the gorilla game preserve to take contingents of the Ugandan army, marched them through the game preserve into Rwanda, where they took off their insignia and called themselves the RTF. The whole operation is run by the British. British intelligence, through Linda Chalker and through people like Tiny Rowland, 
who's an asset personally of the royal household of the Queen. Because the London Regizia Company, through David Ogilvy of the Queen's private household, and through the ministrations of Lord Peter Carrington, the patron of Henry Kissinger, turned over the London Rhodesia Company to Tiny Rowlands, or Roland Rowlands, who was a Rhodesia activist with a Nazi past. And he runs Lonro. And Lonro is one typical of the key institutions which are actually on the ground responsible for what you saw in Rwanda. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Mr. LaRouche. Um, so if you're just joining us, this is the Schiller Institute event, The World Needs More People, Why True Economic Progress Depends Upon Population Growth. So our next speaker, who I'm very happy to have with us, is Dr. Kelvin Kem, who is a South African nuclear physicist. He's the former chairman of the Nuclear Energy Company of South Africa. And currently, he's an associate with Stratech Business Strategy Consultants. So thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Kem. Let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be with you. Um, it's interesting that uh, I'm here in, in Africa. I'm talking out of Pretoria at the moment, which is the capital of South Africa. And uh, for us, the perspective is often very different different. Uh, I just had a notice the other day, I'm on a distribution group of one lot where somebody sent a message from the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, everybody is terrific. Spring is coming. You know, we're preparing for spring. Well, for us, it's autumn. Uh, some years ago, I was involved with the development of the ISO 14000 series. Uh, the first meeting was held in Paris, and it became a bit of a um, source of amusement over some time that uh, what happened is that every time they sent meetings out, meeting notices out, uh, they would say, oh, it'll be ready by the spring. And I would joke about, say, good heavens, you're going to do it in a month. And they said, no, no, uh, spring is like six or seven months. I said, not for me. There's a second half to the planet because they kept saying, think globally, act locally. And I said, you guys keep thinking globally, but you don't think of the other half of the planet where summer is when you have winter and so on. And eventually after about a year, Somebody in Canada sent out a message in the spring and in brackets, uh, the, the autumn for some. So I said, congratulations, you're finally listening. Now, that goes a lot further into all sorts of society issues. Uh, we heard earlier about the Earth Day, where Earth Day is going to get everybody to commit to do the same sort of thing and that's that, the other. Uh, certainly, Earth Day is not at all one of my favorite events of the year. It's usually... Um, a large amount of nonsense that is spoken because it comes from a perspective of a certain group of people trying to tell everybody else what to do. Now, Africa is large. Africa is bigger than the United States, China, Europe, and Japan added together. Just Madagascar, the island of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean is larger than um, Great Britain. So for us, when we think of things like distances and all sorts of things like that, they're very, very different. And it took me years, a long time ago, before it really started to strike me that often you'd find from Europe, things would come and say, well, it's a long way. It's 100 kilometers. We think nothing of getting in a car and driving 100 kilometers from meeting and turn around and coming back. That's not a long way. But what happens is the attitude is very much um, molded by those European and first world types of thoughts. And this is what you see in Earth Day. You see Earth Day telling you, cut back on this, cut back on that. Now, a while ago, uh, I did a job for the Reserve Bank in Zambia. And we, in fact, went uh, 150 or so kilometers out of Lusaka, uh, where we took a game lodge. There was the governor of the bank, plus 63 of the top staff and me. And we took the lodge for a week and we sat and studied the operations of the bank. On the way out, I noticed every so often on the side of the road, there were like teepees of wooden logs. So I'm talking about wooden logs, two meters long, piled up in, in conical form along the road. And I said to my driver, local Zambian, I said, what are those piles of logs? Oh, that's firewood for people to buy on their way home. So people in the city over the weekend would drive home some 100 kilometers plus to go home for the weekend, 
and buy these logs on the side of the road as fuel for the weekend to buy, to burn back at, um, at their simple dwellings out in a rural area. Now, where were the fellows on the side of the road getting the logs from? They were going into the trees there and cutting them down and hauling them to the side of the road. And there were many of these, I'm not talking about one or two, logs everywhere. And yet they are being told, do the right thing now for the environmental concerns of the planet. Go to wind and solar. Don't use coal. Don't use this. But meantime, they're cutting down logs on the side of the road. The, the state of mind is just completely different. So it's very irritating. We in South Africa, for example, here, uh, for a few years now, have been getting wind and solar. And I'm one of the ones that finds it very irritating. There's no solar at night and there's no wind when the wind doesn't blow. And if it's nighttime and the wind doesn't blow, you don't get any renewable energy. So you've got to have coal or nuclear on standby all of the time to fill in if the, so if the wind doesn't blow. But we get told us there's, a, in fact, a, quite a number of Germans in South Africa at the moment pushing very much to sell German wind technology and so on. And if one speaks against them, there's a lot, a lot of friction that occurs, to put it mildly. Recently, we've been told for some time now, go for the hydrogen economy. Look at all the advantages of hydrogen, hydrogen cars, hydrogen this. You just got to think back not so long ago, uh, the Hindenburg, which was on hydrogen, that burst into a ball of flame. Then you say, but wait a minute, you fellows are talking about hydrogen to drive 20 kilometers. You're talking about hydrogen within a city limit with um, filling points or however you're going to do it, bearing in mind hydrogen is very explosive. For us, when we think of fuel, you put fuel in a car and it's nothing to drive five or 600 kilometers before you expect to refuel. We don't sit and imagine hydrogen filling stations conveniently every dozen kilometers down the road and so on. And the same goes for electric cars. Electric cars have their place. But trying to tell people here to do what Europeans in the first world and the Earth Day type of people want because it's in their interests. So I totally subscribe to what was said earlier that so many people in Africa are being instructed to do as they told rather than being told, do what's good for you. What's in your interest? <coughs> Excuse me. For example, I was involved for some years in the malaria issue. Malaria is still serious in many parts of Africa. South Africa, it's, it's largely under control except for certain border areas largely adjacent to Mozambique. But in Africa at the moment, one African child dies every minute from malaria, 24 hours a day. That's the equivalent to something like five Boeing 747s slamming into the ground every day with 100% loss of life. That's the rate of death from malaria. I know numbers of people that have had malaria, people who get malaria. A couple of my friends, um, senior scientists in Pretoria, have gone to a border area and returned and died within a week or two if they get this uh, cerebral version. And yet we were told, do not use DDT because in Europe they've decided that it's bad because DDT does all this thing to birds and so on, which it turns out it doesn't. I did a substantial investigation into DDT. I found people who'd eaten DDT. They'd uh, had so much DDT around them. I went on a national campaign for a while doing a public lectures on DDT. I did television, radio appearances on DDT and so on. And I remember so clearly uh, after one of my public presentations, uh, an old lady came up to me very hesitantly and said, oh, could she ask me a question? Because I'd said in my presentation, look, DDT is not going to give you cancer. That's all a myth. It hasn't done so. And she came up and said, I'm so relieved to hear that. And I said, oh, I see. And she said, yes, when I was a little girl, my mother gave me and my sister a teaspoonful of DDT every week to ward off um, polio. Now, polio was a big problem. And then polio vaccine came about. But when DDT was seen to be the magic chemical against um, malaria at the time, people thought, wow, if this is a magic thing, mothers in desperation were giving their children teaspoons full of DDT every week to ward off polio. It doesn't work. It doesn't ward off polio. But I came across numbers of people that were fed DDT weekly by the spoonful by their parents for years, and they're fine. But this lady said she'd been living for about the last 60 years of her life 
in mortal fear of the cancer she's going to get because of all this DDT she had. I had found people that were covered in DDT, uh, had been working with it and so on. And it's really not reasonable to come up uh, as a result of the Rachel Carson book and, and other things that turned out to be mostly fantasy, that this type of thing is being done. To this day, in um, Mozambique and certain other places, they did scared to use DDT to combat malaria because American foreign aid companies say, we will not give you foreign aid if you don't buy it by well, our environmental regulations and our environmental regulations do not allow for the, the use of DDT. So we'd rather that your children die and your adults get sick than uh, allow you to, to save them because it's in our interests to abide by the, um, the psychology we find back home, which so much of which is generated out of Earth Day and so on. So it is really interesting looking from an African perspective. Now, something else. Uh, which I'm able to see and I found a lot better than some first world people, excuse me saying it, that in a country like South Africa and some of our adjacent countries, we can see a whole range of um, levels of society. In South Africa, you get some of the most advanced things in the world. We had GSM cell phone technology two years before the United States. We had texting on cell phones two years before the United States. In fact, I demonstrated texting in the United States Senate. They'd never seen it before. It's an amusing story, I can tell. Uh, when I went there at one point, my cell phone was too advanced to work in the US. So I had to go and find other ways of, of making phone calls. So we've got things at the leading edge uh, of, of the first world. But we've also got people at the other end who live in mud huts. And there are people at the other end who don't know the earth is round. They don't know there's a country called the United States. They don't know an ocean exists. So we grow up being very used to the fact that certain individuals will understand exactly what GPS is and how cell phone technology works, but there are other people that you can't assume this. And so I've realized, you know, I've gone out in the bush a lot in my life. I enjoy walking in the bush. Uh, there's still wild animals around. If you work, walk in certain areas, you can walk between giraffes and that and so on. It, it's very enjoyable, but it shows you that there's an extremity from one end of society to another. And so it becomes rather offensive when people in the first world have an Earth Day and so on and tell us to swap to hydrogen, when in some of the African countries like Zambia, they're still cutting down trees uh, now to, to fuel. Instead of saying to them, use coal. I mean, if, for example, you were to want to cut coal CO2 emissions, and I'm not a great believer in the CO2 story at all. I do not think human produced CO2 is, the, is resulting in any harmful global warming. But if you want to actually reduce CO2 emissions in Africa, one way to do it is to build some coal fired power stations. Now, that might sound um, contradictory. The reason why is you know how many people there are that are still cooking at night on wood and dung fires and sleeping at night with coal braziers or charcoal braziers indoors and then they shut the doors and windows. Here it used to happen regularly every winter that people would die from carbon monoxide poisoning because they'd have a coal fire or charcoal fire going and they'd seal up all the doors and windows and in the morning the family was dead because they didn't understand the the ventilation required if you've got slow burning charcoal. This still happens all over the place in Africa. So if you were to supply them electricity, coal produced electricity, you would reduce the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and all the other stuff that comes off the many dung fires and wood fires and all sorts of other things that are currently still being used. But they are being told to produce hydrogen for hydrogen cars. Here we are told, Get into hydrogen, but it must be all these colored hydrogen. You can get red hydrogen, what yellow hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, and so on. You were to go for producing this green hydrogen because of the massive export market. Then you say, what export market? I, the other day on a group, said, what export market? A lot of these foreigners jumped on me with it like crazy, saying, look at the export market. And I said, show me, show me one buyer. I said, well, look at the market in Germany. Look at the market. I said, well, I don't see a market in Germany. I see the market uh, being discussed a lot. Germany talking a lot about if they make it. But hydrogen is dead easy to make. Chemically speaking, it's very easy to make. Why would anybody want to buy it from us? 
if somebody wants hydrogen from us, come along and sign a multi-million dollar deal for the next decade up front. Then we'll make your hydrogen for you and send it to you. Don't tell us to make the hydrogen first. And then when we've invested in all that buying your equipment, that you're then going to buy our hydrogen afterwards. I don't want to see that. I want to see truth and reality. And so here, I'm a nuclear physicist, as you heard, and I'm very pleased to say the current uh, Minister of Energy in South Africa, Gwedi Mantashi, is pro-nuclear, said a number of pro-nuclear things. We need more electricity at the moment. We should have had more than we've got. And so there's moves now, there's a program to look into nuclear, large scale nuclear power stations. Uh, we've got five sites identified already. Two of them have been cleared with the envir environmental impact assessments, ready to use to build uh, 3,000, 4,000 megawatt stations. Uh, we're currently completing two of the big, the th both the third and fourth largest power stations in the world are both coal fired power stations of about 4,000 something megawatts. Uh, they're partially running now. And we're also, though, looking into small modular reactors. Now, bear in mind, a large nuclear reactor is 3,000, 3,500, 4,000, maybe that type of megawatts. That's a large power station of a number of reactors, not one reactor. But a pebble bed reactor, for example, a small modular reactor is 100 or 200 megawatts. So they're much, much smaller. South Africa designed a couple of uh, small modular reactors, gas-cooled reactors, because we don't have a lot of inland water. We have two oceans, one on each side of the country, Indian on the, the east and uh, Atlantic on the west. So we have lots of water down there, but we don't have inland water. So we designed gas-cooled reactors to be able to put, say, in the mining regions and in the, in the distant regions. We've got one uh, very considered very attractive desert area in South Africa called the Karoo. Uh, the Karoo is an area that's absolutely remote. You can drive for an hour and see not a single human being and maybe two or three cars. But the Karoo is bigger than Germany. And yet Germany comes and says, do it our way. And you say, but you guys don't drive 400 kilometers in a straight line and see no other human beings. You don't understand what we've got to do. So. It really is something that is highly irritating being in Africa generally and in South Africa and finding that we get dictated to with people not wanting to take into account that the perspective from here is not the same. And even other African countries, their perspective is completely different to South Africa because South Africa produces and uses about 50% of the electricity of the entire Africa. So some African countries are 20% electrified or less. You can't go to somebody who's 20% electrified and tell them to cut back on electricity consumption. The only thing that they can honorably do is aim for a 100% increase immediately, then do it again and again and again. South Africa is near at 85 plus percent electrified. We need to double our electricity consumption in any way we can to improve the lifestyle of the people, to give them clinics, to give them education. We don't want to go along and start not using the coal that we have as a, as a natural major asset in the country, because somebody else in the first world is telling us that under their belief system, we've got to toe the line, that if our children die of malaria and such like and don't have clinics, then tough luck, we've got to do as they say. Our population must be seen as an asset, not as a liability, and the same for many others in Africa. And so I really support the sentiments that I've heard so far. And uh, I hope what I've said contributes to people understanding that the, the whole world, while it's a, the world is getting smaller and, and we all have to work together and so on, there's still a vast difference between different peoples. And we mustn't for, force one set of rules onto everybody else in a blind and selfish manner, which I think is happening far too much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Um, very hard hitting, thank you. So before I introduce our final speaker, let me just say that for our discussion period, after our next speaker, we do have uh, a few people who are with us, um, who are experts in various fields from nuclear energy to climate science. So I'm just kind of giving them a heads up to um, be prepared to offer responses and thoughts. 
So that said, our final speaker today is Jason Ross, who, as I mentioned, is on the board of directors of the LaRouche organization and is a science advisor to the Schiller Institute. And Jason's presentation is titled, The Only Limits to Growth Are Self-Imposed. Jason? Okay. Thank you, Megan. And uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Kim for that really excellent presentation. That was a very informative. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what I'd like to go through today, I want to talk about something that's related to a report that the LaRouche organization uh, just published called LaRouche Crushes the Green New Deal Fraud. And we can uh, pull up an image of that, we can see what we're talking about here. Um, in this report, we go through how the Green New Deal is not something that is planned to make a better future for people, but is to reduce the world's population. Now, Diane had discussed... Um, Prince Philip and his desire to be reincarnated as a deadly virus. Now, for people who didn't really hear how this happened, um, you know, he passed away from a heart condition. We have an image from the physician's office when he was first diagnosed uh, with his heart issue. I think you can see it on the, on the x-ray there. Here's what Prince Philip had to say in the foreword to a book, uh, If I Were an Animal. I'm not, maybe, maybe he is. He says, I just wonder what it would be like to be reincarnated in an animal whose species had been so reduced in numbers that it was in danger of extinction. What would be its feelings toward the human species whose population explosion had denied it somewhere to exist? I must confess that I am tempted to ask for reincarnation as a particularly deadly virus. And this is the man who is so concerned about the future of the world and uh, who wants to make sure that we have a pleasant future for everybody and a safe one. Let's consider this fellow who is menacing tones uh, we are familiar with from nature documentaries. The human population can no longer be allowed to grow in the same old uncontrolled way. If we do not take charge of our population size, then nature will do it for us. So why can the human population not continue to grow in the same old way, uh, as uh, Sir David Attenborough puts it? Well, in a certain sense, he's right. Humanity can't grow in the same old way. Without the introduction of new technologies and new scientific principles, mankind's growth will hit a limit. This limit is something that Lyndon LaRouche called the potential relative population density of the human species. Or, or for a certain culture uh, of the human species. That is, the potential number of people that can be supported by a given land area using the kinds of technologies and social organization that are available at the time or in the culture, well, that sets a limit. And indeed, you can't surpass that just by doing more of the old thing. You need to develop new resources, new technologies. And that is exactly what the Green New Deal ceases to prevent, uh, acts to prevent uh, by sending us backwards on the track of human development. Why does Sir David Attenborough believe that world population must be controlled by us, and if not, by nature? Because he believes that resources are limited. Are they? Well, that was the title of a book published by the Club of Rome, The Limits to Growth. This is the report that uh, they had put out. Lyndon LaRouche disagreed, and he wrote a book, There Are No Limits to Growth. And uh, here's, a, here's a quote from the Limits to Growth, from the Club of Rome, which created the Limits to Growth. First, one of their earliest authors, who wrote a uh, 200 years earlier, Thomas Malthus, he said, the power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce subsist subsistence for man that premature death must, in some shape or other, visit the human race. Now, in terms of the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man, the earth doesn't produce much in the way of subsistence for man, at least not the earth alone, unless you actually are in the habit of wandering into the forest and killing bears and then bringing them home to eat them, or if you find truly wild berries in your journeys through the forest or dig up morals or something like that, you are not relying on subsistence from the earth, you're relying on agriculture which is subsistence from human beings. So unlike animals, which consume resources and themselves are in turn resources for others in the you know, web of life, 
we produce resources. Dr. Kem had referred to the use of wood as a fuel, and wood indeed is a fuel with the discovery of fire. But think about how coal completely transformed the equation there. Coal became a resource rather than a mineral or a rock formation of interest only to a geologist. Coal became of interest to everybody with the development of steam power. We created a resource. We transformed a rock into a resource, a mineral deposit into an ore, or in this case, uh, coal. So the Club of Rome in 1972, we can see what they had to say. If the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. Now, truly, in their book, they believed it would come much sooner than that. What they had done was they tried to wow people with lousy computer models, similar to some of the computer models that we have today that are claiming to predict the future of the entire world's climate over a period of years. The Club of Rome used computer models with such incredibly bland and nondescriptive and uh, overbroad parameters as population, pollution, resources, and these kinds of things, and showed how resources and pollution would interact with each other over time and, and bring about the uh, end of the human race. However, they did not count on entirely new technologies being produced, which is the obvious solution to the very real problem of any society that ceases to progress. If you stop progressing, you go extinct. Just ask the dinosaurs. The mammals are far superior, and that's why we're here, and they aren't. Okay, let's talk about energy over time, because the type of energy that human beings have used has transformed both in quantity and in quality. Here in this image, we can see how the initial source of world energy was traditional biofuels in red at the bottom. That's things like the stacks of wood uh, that Dr. Kem spoke about. Now, if you look at the growth in energy consumption, it wasn't because we started cutting down more trees, although this did go up um, somewhat. It's because we developed new resources, like coal, like oil, like natural gas, like the red that you see in the top, nuclear, which has been far too underutilized. And as we look at the different regions of the world, the level of growth uh, that we see in the Asia Pacific is absolutely phenomenal. This is the growth in countries coming out of, uh, coming out of poverty and doing so with an energy infrastructure able to support industry, science, and technology. Let's contrast the sources of energy in two different types of country. So on the left, well, on the left, on the left, there are two, two types of countries that you see there. Developed countries, where in green is petroleum, a large source of power. Uh, yellow is coal, gray is gas. If you compare that with a typical developing country, the blue line on the left there is biomass. Biomass has somehow turned into a sexy or progressive word, as though it's a new thing to burn wood. But that's what it means, burning plants. So raising corn to turn into ethanol to burn it instead of feeding it to a person or an animal, well, that's biomass. In Ghana, which you see on the right, look at where the energy comes from. Fuel wood, 58%. Charcoal, 31%. Now, where does that charcoal come from? Charcoal comes from wood. So essentially, low energy usage means wood, biofuels. That also means a lot of pollution. If your source for heat in your home for cooking is a biofuel fire, well, you're dealing with the kind of smoke, with the kind of emissions that come out of that um, inside the home. So let's talk about what the difference is in terms of how much you get out of developing a new power source. So in this image, uh, what we were able to see is what's called the energy return on energy invested. Excuse me. <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, if you take a look, I'm sorry, this is in French, but if you take a look at the third set of lines right there, it says Aeolien, which is uh, a windmill. 
the blue line is how much return you get on the invested energy in creating a windmill and the ancillary infrastructure. So you build a windmill, you get 16 times more energy out of that windmill than you had to consume in producing it. This is mining the resources, producing the steel, producing the fiberglass blades, transporting them, and all of that. This is a, a number that might be used. However, in yellow, what you do is you see what happens when you take into account storage. A drop of 75% in the energy returned on energy invested, taking it below the level of economic viability. So what does this mean? And a windmill on its own produces energy sometimes, and if you add up all the energy it produces, you can say, oh look, it's way more than went into making the windmill. But a windmill is increasingly useless the more of them that you build, because they are unreliable. So along with your windmill, if you want to actually be sure you have power all day, you have to either create storage or back up power plants. That is, in order to support the some windmills, you have to build a natural gas power plant that actually works all the time. You're doubling, essentially, your capital investment in terms of how many megawatts of power capacity you're installing. Not quite doubling, but it's, it's almost doubling. When you consider that, they become absolutely useless, throwing money away. And here's why. So this is an example of different fuel sources. The energy contained in one ton of wood is also found in 500 pounds of coal, or 340 pounds of oil, so an improvement, an improvement, or 0 0.0002 pounds of uranium. That's also 75 milligrams, and either number is basically incomprehensible if you try to imagine it in some, cor some type of uh, everyday uh, relationship tiny amounts of fuel, a million times more energy dense in uranium. So fuel intensity, nuclear is off the charts. Like You wouldn't even be able to see that thing if it were a chart. It would be like just a line at the bottom of the axis, literally off the chart. Here is the amount of material that goes in to making energy sources. And the word clean, that was not my choice. That was the original title of this uh, chart. I don't think it's accurate. So here you can see per amount of energy produced, not energy capacity, how much it might supposedly produce, but the actual amount of energy that you get out of it. Look at nuclear on the right. Look at how much material is required per amount of energy that you're getting from nuclear. Look at wind. Look at hydro. Look at how many tons of material are required to produce solar panels able to generate as much energy as a nuclear power plant. The fuel consumed by the nuclear plant is almost nothing, and even the material going into making that power plant is almost nothing if you compare it to wasteful solar panels. What we have to think about is how do we provide energy as a whole to society? So this is a dynamic approach. Rather than looking at one energy source at a time or one power plant at a time, we say, how do we create a network, a platform, that's able to support a certain quality of economic activity? That is, if you are going to industrialize, if you're going to be building factories and the like and increasing the productivity of labor, well, you need a reliable power supply. If you build a factory and you're able to use it for only four or five or six hours per day, is that economically viable compared to if you're able to run 24 hours a day by having a reliable energy source? So what we have to think about is we got to get away from thinking of one energy source at a time, you know, one solar panel on your roof at a time, and think, how do we provide society with the power that it needs? And here you see the issue with that. This is a chart of wind generation in 2018, just to sort of pick a year, and then below 2019. That orange line, way up at the top there, that's the amount of wind capacity that supposedly is installed. So supposedly in 2018, there were 180 gigawatts of windmills in Europe. The blue chart at the bottom, the blue curve at the bottom, that's how much power it's actually making. So take a look in you know, July or August, look at the summertime. 
Mm. The average is what, maybe 25, 30? That is a tiny portion, you know, 10, 15%. As a year average, maybe 15, maybe 20% of what the installed capacity supposedly is. You can't count on it. There's a cost to that unreliability, and you can actually measure it. This is a uh, chart that some researchers created by looking at how expensive it is to have wind. Now, the x-axis going across horizontally is what percent of electricity is generated by wind. So if I'm only going to have a tiny amount of electricity produced by wind, I'm building the first windmill you know, in the history, you know, in my area, then we'd look all the way at the left side of the chart. The blue is the generation cost. This is what does it take to actually produce that windmill compared to the energy that comes out. And you can see a line there about 60 euros per megawatt hour. But the full cost, the cost of providing an energy system, you can see as you go up to maybe 40% or even before that 30% wind, if you had that as your goal, the cost of providing that wind energy will double because as part of a system, it's useless. Here's some, some other similar uh, estimates on wind and on solar. The more of it you have, the worse each piece is. It's sort of like the opposite of uh, what you get by uh, going in, in, in bulk or economies of scale. Here, the economy of scale is negative. So to, uh, you know, to conclude on this and then move on to the discussion that I'm eager to engage in, as I'm sure we all are, the, uh, the, the point to take here from this is that I'd just like to restate LaRouche's approach on resources and on the limits to growth, which is that there are no limits to growth because the universe is infinitely discoverable, and we will never run out of new physical principles to uncover and to create as hypotheses in our minds. There are so many fields of science where if you go just beyond the surface, you realize that we don't actually have it all figured out. You know, chemistry, maybe we think we have a certain pretty good knowledge about that, and I agree. How about nuclear science? There is so much that we don't understand. What is the best way to create nuclear reactions? Why do nuclei have the characteristics? Why do isomers have the, uh, yeah, why do isotopes have the characteristics that they do? If you change the number of neutrons, why does the resulting behavior of the, the nucleon vary as it does? We don't have complete answers to these things. And as we come to discover more about nuclear science, as we unlock the power and the potential of controlled thermonuclear uh, uh, when we, we controlled uh, fusion, nuclear fusion, well, this is going to be the springboard for the next level of energy development that will make us today seem almost as energy impoverished as we would looking back 200 years before the introduction of the steam engine, back when the only power sources human beings had were those proposed by the Green New Deal today, going back to hydro, wind, and biofuels, instead of that leap that we had with the introduction of coal and, and powered machinery, with the introduction of understanding electromagnetism and the ability to use motors and communication systems and control systems and all of this, and then the energy unleashed through controlled nuclear fusion, well, this may make us view resources and even water in an entirely different light as we become able to make economically viable, physically viable, the desalination of seawater at a level not only for, you know, residential, for, uh, you know, for city use, but for agricultural use as well, just to give one example. So that is the future that we can create that can actually eliminate poverty on this planet. And the Green New Deal approach will perpetuate poverty. It will reduce the potential carrying capacity of the earth for human beings, it will result in depopulation if it is implemented. And this is why, as the rubber meets the road, more and more countries like India are simply saying, no, we cannot achieve these goals without holding back our development, and we will not do that. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. And thank you to Diane and Dr. Kem as well. So maybe we can pull 
all of, or pull, get please all of the speakers up on the screen here. Um, for to kick off our discussion period, I just want to open it up to you three and see if anyone, anyone wants to respond to what's been said so far. Maybe Diane, so I, I'll start with you. Yeah, I really enjoyed Dr. Kem's comments because I think people get very myopic and they don't consider what it's like in other parts of the planet and also your description of being in an area, even you don't have to go very far to find people who are in the extremes of what they know about the world, what technology they're using, et cetera. I just found that very interesting and found it a little hard to imagine being on a highway and seeing people selling piles of wood on your way home um, to burn somewhere. So I think that's really very, very useful. And I think all those hordes of people gathered in New York City on Earth Day and that picture I showed from the New York Times should perhaps consider some of these things. Oh, well, it's um, interesting you say that because it is something that I say it, it had to strike me. I, I grew up here, so to me it was natural the way I grew up. But it, when I went to Europe and places like that, and I discovered that people there had very little comprehension of some of these things. Uh, you know, I'd say, well, one thing we have here, for example, when I go uh, to Europe, or people will say, do you really have wild animals there? And you find many people think that I can't walk out of my front door to my car because there might be a lion in my front garden. Well, the answer is there isn't. There aren't any lions in the front garden here. Um, <laughs> but you don't have to go very far where they are some. So that many people think that, oh, there aren't any animals walking around free. They're all in reserves or chained to poles. I mean, that's not true. So here are the regular stories of strange things that happen that we say, oh, no, not again. And to the rest of the world, often it is really odd. Um, a couple of years ago, in Pretoria, through the main freeway, a fellow came driving down the main freeway with two giraffe in the back of a light pickup truck. And he hadn't calculated that the male giraffe was just slightly too high for the bridge. And he drove under a bridge and it hit the head of the male giraffe and killed it. So there's a dead male giraffe lying on the freeway. So the newspapers say, idiot, why didn't he take him to the female? Luckily enough, was just short enough that she made it through the bridge. So here they go along and there's a fuss, but that made it into the American newspapers and so on. But here somebody can drive a car into a hippopotamus, which is standing on a freeway. And things like this, and that gets in the newspapers and say, well, they shouldn't have done that and they should have watched out. But it's not a major issue. It, uh, you don't get it typically in the cities, but it happens every so often. And we say, oh, well, uh, we get foreigners come here and they go into the, the bush area with cars and they drive right up to an elephant, which is standing in the road in a reserve area, and hoots at it to get out of the way. The elephant then just grabs the car and tips it upside down and stamps on it. Uh, we know not to do that. You don't drive up to wild elephants and irritate them. But uh, first of all, people often think that all elephants, you can hand them bananas and apples because they've seen them only in the zoo. So there's a whole world in one country is a slogan that's used here. And that's very much what we see. And it's so um, indicative of this attitude of things like uh, energy, where we are told what to do because people in Germany or people in somebody else and, and Greta Thunberg says, this is what you're supposed to do. And if you don't, there's going to be sanctions and they're going to block this and they're not going to allow that. It's really irritating. It's time they started to realize that if you want to save people, then save people by giving them energy. Give them an opportunity to work their way up. Don't tell them that they've got to do it your way. They're, with population, there will be a natural break on population, a natural putting the brakes on population growth as time goes by. And that is when families become wealthy enough to look after themselves well. At the moment, it's still the case that some um, very rural families will have large numbers of children because they are seen as the insurance policy for the adults as time goes by, because they expect a number of the children to die. So to have people to look after the parents in their old age traditionally have a lot of children. That happened in the UK and it happened across Europe 200, 300 years ago. But large families, where they expected a high death rate. When you improve the standard of living so that the death rate is no longer high and that 
your general medical care is good and lots of things improve, the natural improvement of life causes families to move into a, um, a first world type of living condition where they naturally limit the family. So that's the best way to do it. Give them electricity, give them a 21st world lifestyle, and the population will limit itself to the correct amount that you want. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I think, as I mentioned, we have a, a number of qualified respondents who have been listening today, and I wanna open it up to them to see if they have anything they'd like to add to the discussion or any questions they'd like to ask. So I would just ask if you are there to go ahead and unmute your video and audio and speak up and please introduce yourself. Uh, can Thank you me. hear me? This is this is there Jeff Phil, Philbin. Hi. Yes. Uh, hi, I um, I'm from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I am a nuclear engineer, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the talks today. They were extremely well done. I I would like to add that uh, with regards to the environment and the CO2 issue. Uh, CO2 improves plant life growth, and the fact that we have a slightly higher part per million CO2 in our environment today has resulted in the fact that there are lar larger green zones uh, around, you know, spreading out uh, in certain areas of the of the planet, and. Uh, Plants use that additional CO2 and they thrive on it. In fact, many greenhouses uh, purposely introduce uh, CO2 to increase the productivity of their, of their plants. Uh, our, our current uh, environmental load of CO2 is about 400 parts per million as I understand it, but in the past, uh, based on uh, scientific uh, evidence from tree rings and so forth, the CO2 in the environment has been as high as four times that, more like 1,600 to 1,700 parts per million. So I, I have not been one to um, feel like there's a human-caused uh, climate change. You know, there's uh, sunspots and other things cause some of the f climate changes that we've had, and we we've had uh, periodic uh, warming uh, trends and periodic uh, cooling trends across uh, uh, the, the long history of this planet, and that's been shown from scientific evidence. Uh, that's all. I'll, I'll uh, sign off now and let others comment. Well, I'd like to say that I agree entirely with you, that if anything, the planet at the moment is CO2 deprived. If we get a bit more, we'll get more greening of the planet, which is what the extreme environmentalists tell us we need. We can certainly see it. There's evidence now to show that there's um, plant growth taking place on the edges of the Sahara and all sorts of places because of the fact that we are up to the about 420 parts per million now from what it was. We went through, a, the planet went through a period of, uh, of excessively low CO2, in fact, dangerously low. And uh, so we really need a lot more. But there's no indication that it's problematic. There's also very, very little indication that the CO2 is linked to any global warming. There is undoubtedly some global warming. There's been about one degree C rise um, in about the last 150 years. Now, you're always hearing that there's been a 150 degree uh, year period and there's a one degree CO2 rise. And what you hear is that that's since the beginning of the industrial age. That is just a propaganda phrase. By the way, if I take my hands and do that, my hands have gone up in temperature by one degree. That's the amount of temperature increase you're talking about in one and a half centuries. Now, 150 years ago, if I remember correctly, was the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. It was the time that Queen Victoria 
uh, reigned in the UK. It was the time of the Crimean War. Why not say since the, the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, why not say since the Crimean War, if you want a time indicator? But they always say since the beginning of the Industrial Age, as if by implication it was the Industrial Age that caused the temperature rise. There's actually minimal uh, indication of this. If you go back some time, there was a period, the medieval warm period, usually called the MWP, where it would appear that the temperature rose to higher than now. That was followed by the Little Ice Age, which is extremely well documented historically. At the time of the Little Ice Age, the Thames froze over so solidly that people would ride horse-drawn carriages up and down the river, and they had ice fairs. They're paintings. You can look them up quite easily on the internet. Paintings of ice fairs with hundreds of people walking around on the ice. That is how cold it got. That was at the time of Shakespeare, the time at which the first white settlers came to South Africa. The time at, uh, at the end of that period is when first white settlers were going to the United States. Some of the inducement for that, uh, those settlers were that they'd gone through such poor conditions in Europe, because the cold causes crop failures, it causes um, death through plague, uh, energy shortages, and so on and so forth. So we know that these extremes have occurred in relatively recent times. Not You don't have to go back geological times to dinosaurs to find them. They've, there was also Roman warming, there was a Minoan warming that are all very well documented in the scientific and historical records. None of them were a result of industrial carbon dioxide. So why now? The, the answer is that the extreme green lobby want a political reason to block the advance of industry because they want to control the economic growth of countries to restrain things like their ideas of population growth, their ideas of who's permitted to advance and who's permitted not to advance. So they don't want to see large amounts of energy brought online. And that is why they link nuclear in as well. When you say nuclear doesn't produce any CO2, they say, it doesn't matter, we'll find some other reason. Then they come up with things like um, nuclear waste, the unsolved problem of nuclear waste. Nuclear waste is negligible. It's very dangerous, uh, high-level nuclear waste, but there's so little of it, and it's also well controlled by professionals. The real waste problem that's looming right now is wind turbine blades, um, solar panels when they become outdated. What are you going to do with all these solar panels that have got things like arsenic in them that last forever? And, uh, and all this carbon fiber that's been put into these blades and so on is a huge waste problem, but nobody talks about the unsolved problem of wind and solar waste. But they always want to bring up things like this with nuclear, which are fictitious. So there's a, there's a um, very suspicious element underneath all of this anti-nuclear and anti-energy, anti-coal that's going on. It's not just to save the planet. There's much more society manipulation that is designed into this thing, merely using the environment as one of the vehicles to launch these attacks. And uh, to my mind, nuclear small modular reactors are the answer for virtually all African countries, and they should be striving for them to advance electricity production. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond, well, Jason? Or? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say something, too. I, I think that one of the ways that this discussion has been really taken over is by painting everything as a yes or no kind of question. Like, do you deny climate change? Are you a denier? Well, sometimes in the real world, things aren't yes or no. And what's more important is how much. So do human beings have an impact on the climate? I can't rule that out. Um, I think that we do. Now, the question is, how much is that impact? And then the question is, how much does it cost to try to prevent the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere? And how much does it cost to just enjoy having a warmer planet? Does that mean some, a few more air conditioning units? So how much does that cost? And then that, that's one side of things where you just sort of, the whole thing turns into yes or no instead of really thinking through, gee, is it worth spending tens and tens of trillions of dollars to build unreliable sources of energy to address a problem that even if it occurred, we could fix with air conditioning units. So that's one thing. And just the second thing I wanted to bring up is that the way global warming has turned into climate change and that 
it seems that any bad weather event anywhere on the planet becomes attributed to climate change, as though bad weather never occurred, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, which is hogwash nonsense. What it comes down to is an axiom that people hold, or led to hold, uh, to, 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 um, to believe, that any change we make to the planet is somehow inherently bad. Mm. You got to ask, what is the inherent perfection in a world untouched by human beings? Is it really good to have deserts? Is that better than having lush growth? I don't think so. Is it perfect the way things are before we touch them? No, the earth changes all the time. So instead of seeing any change as being inherently bad and a sin against Mother Earth, and it's almost like, it's basically like a religious cult, uh, you got to talk about what is the change? Is that useful or not? And how do you assign value in those things? Well, it's to us as a human species and to our future. Well, I think it's, it's very valid. It's not binary, whether it's either a yes or a no. There's undoubtedly climate um, warming that has taken place of this one degree since the time of Abraham Lincoln. But of that one degree, some of it is due to human influence. There's no doubt about that because the CO2 has been produced by industry. But it would appear that that's tiny, a small amount and inconsequential virtually. By far the most likely reason that there's global warming is due to magnetic variations on the sun. Now I can go into this in great deal detail, but the magnetic variations on the sun interact with the magnetic field around the earth and that shields uh, cosmic rays coming in from outer space. The cosmic rays coming in from outer space affect the cloud cover. When you've got more clouds, the sun doesn't reach the ground and so the ground doesn't warm up and you get global cooling. If you've got less clouds, more sun gets to the ground and the ground heats up and you get warming. And that correlation with the sunspots and with the magnetic field of the sun can be tracked right back through the little ice age, through the medieval warm period, back to the Minoan warming, the Roman warming, and so on. There's a far greater science correlation between the magnetic activity of the sun and the variations in temperature on the earth than there is with the CO2. Uh, CO2, if anything, comes afterwards. If the ocean warms up, the ocean gives off CO2. If it's cold, it takes CO2 up. Uh, I think all of us have used these soda stream machines that you uh, you put, uh, if you want to make cold drinks, pops, uh, fizzy drinks, and they always tell you put the bottles in the fridge and make them nice and cold and then use them when they're cold. The reason why you use the cold water in the soda stream is because cold water sucks up much more CO2 than warm water does. It's well known. That's why a cold ocean will suck up CO2 but a warm ocean, warmer ocean will let some off. So if anything, it's not that the ocean is warming because of CO2, it's probably that the CO2 is increasing because the ocean is warming, because the planet is warming due to um, the magnetic variations on the sun. And uh, the CO2 we've already heard is beneficial for the planet. If anything, we CO2 deprived and we need some more. But certainly the CO2 that we are seeing is probably very little produced by mankind and mostly of natural origin and not problematic anyway. So all of this demonstrations, marching in the street, Earth Day and all this to save the planet for CO2 is just plain and simply incorrect. But if you go to some of these extremists and say, look into the sun, I've tried it, look into the science of the sun, not look into the sun. <laughs> if you go to the extremists and say, look into the science of the sun, they don't want to listen. They say, no, you're a denier. If you say, but I can give you a better scientific answer, they are not interested because you cannot accuse industry if it's the sun. You cannot have a carbon tax. You cannot cause somebody to demand solar and wind power and not use coal. All of that becomes um, a non-option if you say that it's natural. So they don't want a natural solution, even if you can show that the science gives you the right answers with the natural solution. So. The reasons behind all the solar and wind and then hydrogen and heaven knows what else, all interlinked, has got a much deeper um, suspicious origin than just trying to save the planet. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me bring someone in here who I think might have something to say on this. I think I saw him a few minutes ago, um, Tom Weissmuller. We can get him back up on the screen there. Hi, Tom. Can you hear us? Hi. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, now, now we can hear you. All right. Uh, you introduce yourself, yes. Tom. Okay, good. What's that? Oh. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, okay, I'm Tom Weissmuller. Uh, I'm a former NASA, Apollo era NASA. I then worked in different industries. But for the last uh, 25 years, I've been thoroughly engrossed in climate change activities. Uh, and I, I'm not, I shouldn't call it climate change. It started out with global warming. And then when the planet decided not to warm for uh, 18, 20 years, the problem, so-called problem, uh, became known as climate change. Uh, by the way, the climate changes every year in winter uh, to summer. There's a huge difference in climate, uh, and believe me, you feel it. Uh, that's really climate change. The one degree inc increase that they talk about is minuscule to the actual temperature variation on the planet just because of its orbit around the sun. Uh, Mr. Kim was deadly accurate when he talked about the solar cycles dominating climate on the earth, and they do. Uh, and in fact, recently we've been in a decline so that a number of re Russian researchers believe that we are entering a new ice age, or at least maybe a new little ice age. And the evidence is strongly in their favor. The rate of sea level, which has been scaring everyone, uh, has recently been found to be a mistake in the satellite reporting of sea level. Uh, that's done handled in a separate presentation. And if uh, Jason would like, I'll send it to him and he can make it available to everybody. So as far as sea level rise is concerned, I think the case is closed. It does not mean that your uh, local area may not be subsiding, particularly if you live in Florida, if you live in uh, Virginia Beach, yes, the land there is sinking for natural reasons. But there are places on Earth that are so-called tectonically inert. They don't move up, they don't move down. And that's where you want to measure sea level. And the net sea level rise consistent for over 150 years is about 1.1 millimeter per year, period. And uh, that's easily manageable. The Dutch have figured out how to do that by building dikes and things like that, because Holland is actually sinking, much as parts of the American East Coast are sinking. So uh, these problems can be solved by people, by engineering, uh, by using intelligence, and then focusing on other ways, like Mr. Kahn said, developing new sources of energy, putting the brain power of humans behind the question and coming up with uh, different ways to do things. Like for instance, thorium nuclear. Now thorium is element 90 on the periodic table. It is weakly radioactive, but when, condensed it can be made into a nuclear power plant that as a residue will not produce nuclear weapons, but just produce energy. And that's the reason that in the 1950s, the United States Atomic Energy Commission, who knew that thorium would work, went over to uranium instead because they could make bombs as a byproduct. Uh, we don't need that. Is another advantage to a thorium plant. If you put one down near, let's say, where Indian Point is, a thorium power plant can use all the spent fuel rods of the Indian uh, Point power plant as fuel for itself, making their disposal uh, part of finishing off the energy into, uh, input that they can give 
and making it a, a non-problem for disposing them. Uh, there are lots of things that can happen if we put our minds to it and use the human brain uh, to, to do what no giraffe can do, what no cockroach can do, uh, what no other life form on earth can do in solving this kind of problem and solving it beautifully. And that's where we need to, in fact, get more people to use more mental energy and make these things happen for all humanity, not just to preserve an insect or some wildlife in Africa. I know the Brits wanted to use Southern Africa as a game preserve. Well, that's nice when Britain has a power grid and people there have a fairly decent lifestyle and they should look down in Africa and see the lifestyle they're uh, disposing. Uh, it's a travesty. Uh, I think I've talked enough. Uh, I've got some brilliant people here uh, on the stage. Go to it, folks. Thanks, Tom. I actually want to ask Diane, do you have anything to say? Because I know a big part of your campaign has been to do exactly what Tom said and get people to activate their minds and start helping us change things. Sure. I um, Actually, what I was thinking about while he was speaking is the storm surge barrier that I really think needs to be built between Sandy Hook in New Jersey and the Rockaways on Long Island, which is about five miles long. The American Society of Civil Engineers had a conference on this in 2009 and decided it would be much too expensive, which, of course, Sandy was really very inexpensive. I'm being facetious. I mean, we had enormous damage from that storm. And what you're talking about, this barrier protecting, are the ports of Elizabeth and Newark, all of Staten Island, Lower Manhattan, it would be huge. Now, there's a group of engineers who are trying to organize for this, uh, but what they're running up against are people saying, well, we really um, don't think you should do it until you do a feasibility study on sea level rise because we're sure all the measurements are going to be totally different, and therefore the sea level rise precludes it from functioning which I think is an absurd argument. But Tom, as long as you're here, if you'd like to say something about that, it would be great. Well, it is facetious. Like I say, I can, I will send Jason a link to that last presentation to show the divergence between satellite and tide gauges. And you have to resolve that divergence. And the people you're talking about who protest against building the dikes and things like that, are people who are believing in the wrong information that needs to be straightened out. And by the way, uh, the great hurricane of, uh, I think it's 36 or 38, inundated Providence, Rhode Island, so that there are marks on some of the second stories in downtown Providence, where the uh, ocean rose because of combination of the hurricane driving up water and uh, favorable or unfavorable tides. Uh, by the way, New York is susceptible to a 20-foot surge. Uh, Hurricane Sandy only made it up to 13 or 14 feet. So we do have to protect uh, Manhattan. Low Manhattan, by the way, became low Manhattan because of landfill. Uh, and the landfill, they didn't put enough land in there. Uh, very simple. That decision was made in the 1800s, and we are living with the consequences of it. Uh, I heartily agree with protecting Manhattan once and for all, get it done with, no more damage from a hurricane to lower Manhattan. Uh, it's, it's almost nonsensical to think of anything else. Interesting. Thank you, Tom. Um, I, I think we have one more person um, who might want to ask a question. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, let's see, just give him a minute to come in here. 
visitor. <laughs> a wild animal. <laughs> Speaking of wild animals. <laughs> Okay, Dave, do we have our, our guest here or not this time? There he is. Okay, we can see you. We can't quite hear you. I think you might be muted, Dr. Right. Fell. I'm... There you are. Okay, here we are. Can okay, you hear me? Please... Yes, please introduce um, yourself uh, and go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I'm Julian Fell. I am I live in Canada. I'm a uh, I got a doctorate at the University of Maine half a century ago on uh, work I did in, in Antarctica, mostly on oce oceans and biology. Uh, I've had a long interest in uh, astronomy and uh, the controversy over so-called global warming. I sensed it was manure from the very day when it first came out in the 1980s. I suspect among the speakers here that there's a lot more expertise than has come out. Every one of you has spoken of something which uh, I have uh, studied at one point or another. But let me bring my particular spin to it. Um, Mark Twain said it's a lot easier to fool people than it is to convince them afterwards that they've been fooled. And I'm afraid that is very true of the, uh, the moment. Uh, a Nobel Prize winner pointed out that, in fact, uh, this climate, climate science is, in fact, pseudoscience. It doesn't even qualify as junk science. And he provided some definitions, which I found quite amusing. Uh, regarding the med medieval warm period, there was cattle and sheep were grazed in southwestern Greenland, and barley was grown there. And the fences they built around their fields and the barns they built, these are the Vikings, uh, are still there today. You can go see them, but you cannot graze cattle or sheep or grow barley there today. Uh, Greenland sounds way north, but in fact, the latitude is about the same as the Orkney Islands, northern Scotland and the middle part of Norway. Um, now, the, I must be the ultimate denier because my conclusions from all this work I've done is that CO2 doesn't warm at all. It cannot warm, there isn't enough of it. CO2 absorbs radiation only in a very narrow band, the 15 micron band, and a concentration in the atmosphere of about 250 parts per million is enough to saturate the supply of 15 micron radiation. The radiation comes from the ground due to the temperature of the ground and is subject to emissions, uh, the frequency set by Wien's law in physics and the amount set by Stefan Boltzmann law. And this Stefan Boltzmann law basically makes all the predictors of uh, climate change or global warming uh, impossible. You cannot warm a planet up three degrees when your rate of radiation loss increases at the fourth power of the temperature. However, uh, that doesn't stop stupid, and I'm afraid there's an awful lot of it. I, I'm a rather bit of a pessimist because living in Canada, uh, we have, uh, my, our leaders are perhaps some of the most pathetic morons uh, on the planet. They're running around trying to be politically correct, and they don't have the clue what they're doing. And when stupid doesn't work, they go to double stupid. We in Canada are a big food producer and uh, increases in temperature make us uh, a much better food producer. Yet the politicians are trying to shut that down. They can't, of course, because you can't change the climate, but uh, they think they can do that. So I question them, why do you want to shut down food production, which is what we can do more than more for the planet than anyone. And I get blank stares and they, then I start discussing physics and they eventually look at me and say, I don't want to talk to you anymore and turn their back on you and run away. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, uh, yeah, also funny, you mentioned lions in the front yard. That's, that's kind of funny for me because where I live, we have mountain lions. And there is a potential where I live also that I can get lions in my front yard. 
the real cause of climate is, of course, as mentioned by one of the speakers here, is the change in solar radiation, or at least the amount of sunlight that gets to ground level. The uh, electromagnetic emission from the sun hasn't changed. It varies less than, uh, I think, a quarter of a percent in all known history of measurement. What changes, of course, is the sunspot emissions. And this is what influences and the magnetic field of the sun, and it interacts with the magnetic field of the earth, and between them they control the amount of, of cosmic rays, the remnant cosmic rays that can penetrate the atmosphere and create cloud cover, which is why during periods of low sunspots we get more cloud cover and the temperature goes down. Now, so far as uh, not CO2, yeah, BC where I live, enacted a carbon tax. And we using their numbers and their claims of how effective it was, it influences the planet's temperature by five millionths of a degree. So if you tax everybody to that extent, you're still not going to have any effect on the climate. But it's the tax that makes believers feel good and the rest of it is just another damn tax. What is interesting to me is, because this is what I've been dwelling on myself, perhaps getting back to my original work here, is the thermal masses. If you wish to increase the temperature of a planet, you have to increase the amount of heat that is being stored permanently within on the surface of the planet. To this degree, the atmosphere is a terrible storage area. It has no capacity to store heat whatsoever. And yet I find every discussion about climate change seems to dwell only on the atmosphere. The atmosphere has only one eight hundredth the density of water and uh, about one three thousandth the uh, capacity of water to hold uh, the amount of heat can hold per kilogram. Now, when you look at the surface of the Earth, particularly in the latitudes that absorb heat, that is to you, that would be about 45 degrees either side of the solar zenith. The solar zenith, of course, wanders back and forth between the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere due to the tilt of the planet uh, on an annual basis, but it's still collecting the same amount of heat per day. Other than the elliptical nature of the orbit, which is very slight, but it does have effect the amount of heat coming to the planet by roughly 4% between uh, perihelion and aphelion. The co solar collection surface within these 45 degrees of the solar zenith is about 80% seawater. And seawater, of course, has four times the uh, thermal, the, the amount of heat it can absorb by changing temperature than the ground does. And when you start crunching all the numbers, the atmosphere has less, way less than 1% of any ability to store heat. The ocean takes in about 94% and the rest is the surface of the land. And these are the parts that participate in actual climate, which means they can absorb and hold heat. And the ocean, it's the uppermost 50 meters that are influenced seasonally by heat and land you go down about five meters and you reach a zone where the temperature never changes. And so it's only the land above it. I may, Dr. Fell, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think what you're getting at is really an important point in the discussion here, which you've yep. clearly established, which is that the there is no lack of um, proof that what's being claimed on the part of the people who are saying that the developing world shouldn't develop and should have windmills and so forth, there's no shortage of science to disprove all of the so-called, um, you know, climate change alarmism. And I think it does come down really to number one, the moral question that we were discussing at the beginning, and then number two, that and I kind of want to see if Diane has something to say on this, the organizing question because you. You used to call yourself a bit of a pessimist, but I think um, what what surprises many people who run into the Schiller Institute is even though we are very clear on how bad the state of the world is, we're actually quite optimistic about being able to change it. So I just wanted to see if Diane might want to respond to what you've brought up from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I've spoken too much. 
No, no, no. no. Well, well, thank you so much. It, it actually, um, it caused me to reflect on this. You know, these crazy people would have you take the view, and it's really terribly arrogant. I mean, there's 8 billion humans on the planet. Each one of us shouldn't think that we're the greatest genius in the universe or that uh, or ever will be. But the idea you almost have the idea that what they want to portray is our planet and atmosphere is like a gigantic closed area and driving an automobile or something is like a thermostat. So if you curtail your activity, you can actually chart how much you're going to prevent global warming, which is of course completely absurd beyond reason and extremely pompous. Um, to take that view of humanity, which has rather come rather recently to the planet at any rate. But I think um, what everyone has said in terms of the organizing gives us a lot of ammunition, particularly to organize and recruit younger people. Because if you're 20 years old, do you really want to have the view that the planet is going to end because of your birth in the next 18 months or year, um, you would hope to have a future that's 50 years, 60, 70, you know, a long time into the future. And I think that's also why I was very struck actually at the Schiller Institute conference when we heard from people in Yemen or Iraq. Iraq has been being bombed for 30 years. And the Iraqi people were far more optimistic than many Americans that I've spoken to. And I think that's really worth considering because there's something innate in human beings that we know that, as Schiller said, we were born for that which is better, that there is something that we can affect for the good to make life better, to create the conditions where humans can actually work on the development of our creative powers of reason, as opposed to doing physical labor uh, or something similarly mind deadening. And I'm really happy that uh, people have given us so much ammunition in that. And I think we really actually have to get it to many of the younger people, to the campuses, to the, now they're trying to brainwash these poor children in the elementary schools. I mean, I can't imagine. Imagine being six years old and someone telling you that your life was going to destroy the planet. I think that's one of the most evil things that could be done to a young person. So I um, just want to say I really appreciate what everyone has brought to the discussion here. Thank you. Well, we're nearing the end of our program here. So what I'd actually like to do is ask each of our speakers if they have a final thought, final comment. So why don't we start with Jason? Well, I, uh, I'm not sure if I do have a final thought. I feel like this has been a really fun discussion, and I'm glad that we got so many different, uh, different angles on things. I think the only thing I'd like to add would be the importance of acting on all of this. And I know that it can seem kind of overwhelming or difficult at times, especially, I mean, not every one of our viewers, I'm well aware, is, uh, our, this panel is not characteristic of like human, you know, people in general or our viewership in general. You may feel that if you don't have a, you know, a doctorate in nuclear uh, engineering that or physics, that you have a hard time engaging with people on this. That could be. What I'd really suggest people do is to read through the Great Reset Report, the Great Leap Backward, LaRouche Crushes the Green New Deal Fraud that the LaRouche organization put out. Uh, it's at thelarouche.org slash reset. And uh, I'd really encourage you to go through that uh, pamphlet and the material that's linked within it. You can get it on the website there, thelarouche.org slash reset. And I think it uh, does a very good job of helping you understand what the political background is behind creating this, and it really takes it out of the discussion simply of, you know, carbon dioxide or something like that, and it and it puts it in a in a broader perspective of a battle between an attempt to develop the human species based on the idea that every human being is potentially valuable as a genius of the future, and the idea that human beings are essentially animals, and that a few animals more equal than others as they see themselves. 
uh, intend to simply rule over the rest of us as if we were just unnecessary cows or something like that. Um, you know, that's that's the level of 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 what we're we're seeing play out here, and it's important to get the the real background on it. Thank you, Jason. Dr. Kem, would you like to make any closing remarks here? Well, I think what I would like to say is to say to people in general, think for yourself and go and question. There's far too much information that comes about, particularly on the Earth Days and these sorts of things, where all sorts of stuff is said, and it's said as if this is final, we know the answers. All you listeners don't have to think for yourselves. You just have to do as you're told. And what we actually want is we want people to say, does that sound realistic? Is there more to it than meets the eye? Am I being taken for a ride? Now, I believe there are a lot of well-meaning people that are saying the wrong things because they've been fed the wrong information. And I find many people, when you tell them the truth and say, look, what you've believed can't be true, they say, thank heavens you've pointed out to me what is the, the reality, because now I feel much comfortable in, in seeing the truth. So I think I would just like to say to people, think for yourselves, look at something. If it doesn't feel real to you, say, look a little bit deeper and find out is there more to this than I'm being told. Thank you. Thank you. And Diane? What I would like to say is that our intention in this is victory, that we're not um, exposing the fraud of man-made global warming or climate change because of a protest movement, but that human civilization actually depends on our success. That uh, you saw some of these curves that Jason showed in terms of energy production, uh, energy flux density, and similar curve of population growth, which requires an increased amount of energy consumption per capita to attain that. Conversely, if you reduce the amount of energy throughput, you will have a hyperbolic collapse of population. You will have genocide on a mass scale, which Megan referenced at the beginning, and therefore it's simply not acceptable. And I would urge everybody listening to resolve that on your watch alive on this planet, you are not going to allow the billionaires at Davos, these bankers who are funding this, BlackRock and so on, it's all in the pamphlet, to get away with ramming through their policy. I think there's enormous opposition. We're seeing some of that coming now from India, from China. Uh, this is excellent. There's great reason to think that it's not going to go over very well in the United States, but it has to be organized. So don't presume we're going to fail. We can beat this and circulating the pamphlet is crucial. We're also interested in knowing what kind of responses you're getting. We have people who are available. Um, and as you can see, uh, perhaps many qualified people who might make themselves available. If you want to organize forums where maybe you feel like you aren't well enough informed to address it, but you'd like someone else to come in, anything we can do to defeat this we will back up. So please organize um, boldly and aggressively and reach as many people as you can and circulate this report. Okay, well, those are our marching orders. Uh, just to echo what you said, Diane, what I was planning to close with, but don't really need to anymore is exactly <laughs> what you said, that Helga Tsepurush said that it's her sense that this can be crushed. So I think that we, um, we have our work clearly defined for us, and it is not a long-term fight. This is right now, so we need people to mobilize. So get in touch with us. You can go to the, the larouche.org slash reset to get yourself a copy of the pamphlet and get in touch with us and start organizing. So I'd like to thank Diane Sayre, Jason Ross, Dr. Kelvin Kem, and all of our other respondents that contributed today to our event. So thanks everyone for watching. Please share this video. This is a great place for your friends to start, to start becoming educated, and we will see everyone soon.